May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. So we're going to uh, continue our scampering, if you will, through the Apostles' Creed. Uh, once again, in your prayer books, if you wanted to just pull up the text, uh, it's on page 171. Although, as I said, we could look at the baptismal version, which has it as the call and response. And I want to have a crack at doing the entire paragraph, if you will, that's speaking to, the, the, to Jesus. And it's, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. And it's a happy coincidence uh, that we're doing this on the same day as we remember Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, because I'm not that well organized. Um, I would love to claim that I planned this in advance. I'm not that well organized. Uh, but it starts with this uh, notion, this section at least, that in Jesus we have this coming together of divinity and humanity. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. And that's a very political and theological statement right there, because we're talking about Lord. Lord is master, owner, leader, those sorts of things. And in a political climate where perhaps uh, the Roman emperors might have wanted that term to be ascribed to them, slave owners wanted that term to be ascribed to them, for us to be ascribing that term to to God or to Jesus is a political statement because you only get to have one Lord and Master. We're also talking about Jesus as God's only Son. Now early on in the church's history the creeds obviously are at least in part an answer to a series of questions or arguments that are going on. Early on in the church's history there's this whole conversation of what do we do with Jesus. Jesus is very problematic, always has been, uh, still is for Christians, because every time we think we get comfortable, we go back and read the words of Jesus, and it's a problem. Uh, Jesus is constantly a problem for us. Not a bad problem, a good problem, but still a, a discomfort in a sense, inspiring us to be more loving, more generous, more open. Early on in the church, as I was saying, a lot of people wanted to say Jesus is created, like us, like angels, like, like planets, like is a part of creation. But there was a counter movement that said, well, there's a difference between that and being the Son of God. And so there's the affirmation here that Jesus is God's Son. It's a different order of creation. Born of the Virgin Mary, and we read that in our Gospel passage today suffered under Pontius Pilate. Now that's a really important phrase, was crucified, died, and was buried, and I often talk about that, but I'm going to come back to the suffered. So, shortly before Jesus was born, there's a Greek philosopher by the name of Plato, uh, and you might have heard of Platonism and Neoplatonism and those sorts of things, you, you might not have. Anyway, one of the things Plato says is, we know something's a chair, because in our mind, there's a reference to the perfect chair. Now that perfect chair can't exist in reality because reality is full of flaws. You know, if you look at any chair, it might, you know, the wood might not be perfect, the canvas might not be perfect, whatever. But in your mind there is the perfect chair. So we know it's a chair because it's a reflection of perfection. And the perfect can't change, otherwise it wouldn't be perfect. Now, if the perfect can't change, the perfect can't suffer. And so many early followers of Jesus who were also aware of Plato's philosophy um, would say, well, on the cross, maybe it isn't God who is suffering because God is perfect. 
And so they go, well, maybe it just looked like God was suffering. Well, maybe Jesus, who was really human, was suffering, and God, who is in heaven, wasn't suffering. And then there was this long, compl complex argument. Uh, and I'm really grateful that the stream that says, no, 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 on the cross, Christ suffered, is the one that wins. Because that reminds us that God is not so separate from us that God is unable to suffer. And there's a uh, Latin term for the theology, non... No, that's... Oh, rats. Should have written it down. I forgot to write it down. There's a Latin term, basically, that says Jesus actually suffers. But we've got it there in English. Um, that's really important. And it's, it's important in terms of how we live our lives. Because if we say that God suffers like us, we start to recognize that empathy is a really important thing in the nature of God. Empathy means feeling with. And so when we see people who are, in su who are suffering, it becomes right and proper for us as Christians to suffer with them. Now there's one of those things about pain. Pain is there to teach you stuff. It's to warn you of things. It's to give you a heads up. And um, when I was younger, I went to a friend's house. And we were taking apart, you know, one of those um, circuit boards? And we were using a little soldering iron. And his dad said, whatever you do, don't put the soldering iron down on the workbench. Because you'll ruin the workbench. And he was about to put the soldering iron down on the workbench. And I learned something. I learned that if you grab a soldering iron by the hot bit, uh, it hurts. <laughs> I learned something. I don't want to do that again. But if somebody else's pain hurts us, then we want to do something about that too. And so the suffering of Christ on the cross drives Christian empathy. And empathy is feeling with and the desire to do something about. It's feeling with and the drive to do something about Christ died, was buried, he ascended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And I'm not going to focus on that too much. Because I wanted to share this next thing with you. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. And uh, I was recently introduced to this. And I think it's really, really quite cool. So I want to share it with you. <coughs> Often we have this picture and, it, you know, I, I, I've seen it in art, I've seen it in people's language. You know, Jesus of God in a big stern face, maybe sitting behind, you know, the gavel, all the rest of it as our judge. And the problem with that is we've taken our picture of a judge and we've put it onto God. Why? Why don't we say, instead, Jesus is going to be our judge? And we let Jesus inform the picture of what it means to judge rather than our picture of judging inform our picture of Jesus. Why do we let our language and our hang-ups mess up our picture of God? Wouldn't it be a better, more Christian thing, Christian in terms of following Christ, to let Christ inform our picture of what it means to be judged? Isn't that it? Now, when I heard that, I was like, that's really quite cool. And the follow-on from that is the notion of how does grace then operate? Uh, and so the, co the question becomes this. If Jesus is our judge, the one who loves us deeply, then the question becomes, so, Andrew, let's look at how you're going and the decisions you're making. I love you unconditionally, and how did you react to that person? And the answer is frequently not with, with unconditional love. And so I find that I suspect I am a harsher judge of myself in the light of the love of God than God is, in a sense, of me. Because I know the standard now. It's unconditional love. And so if Jesus is my judge, that changes my picture of the judge. But it calls me to a much more engaged interaction with the world by the standard of was I anywhere near the love that Jesus shows I think that's a very powerful image and I wanted to share that with you so when we affirm the faith 
in Jesus Christ. It's a faith in God who comes to be one of us, suffers with us, and judges us in a way that perhaps we would normally expect. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.